Since 1983, fame has helped business and education work for Maine. Contact the authority, the finance authority of Maine. Matt Jacobson, CEO of Maine & Company. Uh, good, lively first session. Let's keep it up. Okay, let's jump right in with the next topic. It is wind energy. A real solution or just more hot air? Uh, wind energy proponents envision a $20 billion offshore wind energy industry in Maine, which state officials are hoping would create upwards of 15,000 jobs and new manufacturing base. How realistic is this, uh, Rose? I'm going to start with you. And are, what are the major barriers to this vision becoming reality? Well, it, certainly we need we need a federal uh, plan, and right now I don't think we're going to get anything federal energy plan. Fed federal energy plan, and so we need to be very aware of the fact that we are just a piece of a much bigger uh, national policy, and this is only going to work with a lot of subsidies. It's expensive. And it's 10 years or more down the road, and we need to be putting our eggs in multiple baskets, not just one. Because unless we're reducing our dependency on foreign oil, and unless we're reducing our cost of electricity, we aren't moving towards a solution, in my opinion. But are you a big be believer in offshore wind? Do you think I Maine think is the Saudi Arabia of wind? I don't. I, I think that that is the silver bullet approach, and I think we need to take a much more conservative approach that spreads out our, our options and our opportunities. Okay. So I'm not, I, I'm not opposed, because anything innovative I'm willing to pursue, but I do it cautiously and thinking about all the other technologies that are out there right. 10 years from now. Well, I agree with Rosa in that we need to put our eggs in more than one basket. I do think that there is this sense that people are either you know all about wind or solar or we have all of these different you know we've got uh, CMP creating a whole new grid we've right. got solar mm -hmm. grid doing you know everybody has their own plan but what we really need is to figure out what main strategic plan exactly. is what we're going to do that incorporates all of those things because we can't depend on just one source of energy and I feel like we should have learned that by now. Absolutely. We've made some bad choices in Maine, and, and we have very expensive electricity, and, and wind is certainly not going to well, help us be more this competitive. Is the, this is the issue to me, is, is we are so far above the national average for energy that it is nearly impossible to make up that cost and compete for businesses here in Maine, which is why our manufacturing base in Maine and is the jobs we want to attract, those year-round manufacturing jobs, are energy dependent. Exactly. And so, and so when the energy costs are as high as they are, and you bring to me a solution that makes the cost even higher. I mean, the best, the best guess on this stuff is 24 cents a kilowatt hour. Oh, I think Maine it's more. I think it's more yes. now, too, but that's the number that I hear. Uh, Maine businesses right now currently pay between 12 and 15 <coughs> cents a kilowatt hour, and that's still 50% above the national average. Th there's inexpensive power for us to go and get not too far from but, here, uh, and so right. we should be looking at alternatives. Right. Okay. And there's another there issue. There, there are a couple issues with it. You say, what are the barriers? First yeah. of all, there's a uh, dissipation issue. It's a technical problem. It's a physics problem. I have an engineering degree. I haven't used in 25 mm -hmm. years, but I know that the, the further away you are from where you generate it, you're going right. to lose, you're gonna yeah. lose that power. The second issue, and one that people don't talk about very much, is this is going to be an 8 by 8 eight mile field out in the middle of the ocean. How do you defend it? Ooh. And that's a significant issue with significant costs. How much per kilowatt does it cost to defend this thing? I think that's, that's even that's an interesting issue point. Is how do you get the energy, you know, back where that's it needs the to be. Right, without, the the without losing right. it all. Right. Exactly. It's like the but squirt gun. I the can defense, you know? defense issue is very interesting, but let's be realistic about how it could disrupt the, the fisheries and how it could disrupt the, the ocean. And we're very aware of what's happening on land. Right. And we don't know what will happen on sea. I'm not opposed there is because research I think that talks a lot that you know yeah. kind of gives you a sense for what that might look like. And there are also places where there are um, in Europe, but nothing yeah, like yes. this kind of depth and nothing like floating the designs that they're currently. Well, there is one. Of. There is one in Europe, but not this kind of depth. Right. Okay. Let me stop it there because uh, we'll talk more about that later. Because my interest in it is there seems to be a, a, a notion by the public out there that this this is this there's a solution looming out there and it's great and it's offshore wind and I don't think folks really know. As I much think about opinion. I think opinion shifting on that. Okay. Okay. Uh, Someone brought up fishing. I want to go to yes. fishing. Okay. And Matt, I'm going to throw this one to you. Okay. This one is called fishing lures. Can and should the Portland Fish Exchange be saved? Landings at the Portland Fish Exchange have dropped from 17 million pounds of fish in 2006 to 6.3 million pounds in 2009, and it's on a track to go down to 4.5 million pounds of landings this year. Uh, the industry blames regulation that push fishermen to land uh, in Massachusetts instead of Maine. Should the state taxpayers uh, provide incentives to the fishing industry to save the Portland Fish Exchange? I think we ought to help the fishing industry. I don't think the right way is to go after the fish exchange okay. and to help the fish. Uh -huh. Here, look at the best fish exchange in New England is in Gloucester. It's privately run. Okay, why couldn't we spin this off, sell it, and let them do the things? That, why does government think they know how to run a fish exchange better than the private folks do that have taken all the business down to Gloucester? Second of all, we tax fuel for fishermen. 
Um, Massachusetts doesn't, New Hampshire doesn't. So of course they're going to go there. That's their biggest expense. And thirdly, we have a bycatch problem. So when you catch something that isn't the kind of fish that you wanted to catch, namely lobster, in Maine they make them throw it back. In New Hampshire you can keep okay. it. So it doesn't mean that they don't fish. They fish, they catch the bycatch, they keep it, and they take it to Massachusetts. Those are two or three policy things that we could change right now it's, and make that a, a revenue producer for Portland and the state rather than make it a, a place where we dump money mm -hmm. and, and compete in a, poorly. I don't think, I don't think the... Um um, dragging and the, and the issues around the lobster fishery will change. I mean, we, we have a sustainable lobster fishery here, and so I don't think we can link the two. The, the, the bycatch. That's the the bycatch, bycatch is going to happen it's, anyway. It's, because it's going to happen anyway. These well, guys they're, just, they're going to Massachusetts to do it, but it's not, a, it's not really, I think, if that's a choice, that's not a one, one way we should incentivize. We should not change that policy. However, there are co-ops that are forming. Look what's happening in Port, Port Clyde, Clyde. Yep. and it's working, and frankly, the quota system is, is the way that this is all but going. Small, but higher quality, smaller volume. The market has got to drive that. I think we ought to have more market-based solutions and get the government okay. out of the well, fish. And, and it will drive it to some extent because we have less fish, in, yeah. in part because we really actually have less fish. Right. And that's right. a sustainability issue. Right. And people are becoming more aware of that. And so they're willing to pay more for a product no, that right. they feel like right. is, is produced well. And so there's a, a number of different issues there. But, you know, this is one of those opportunities to be creative and think outside the box. Why right. not expand the um, pier so that you're doing something more innovative, like bringing a farmer's market to it as well and creating a whole other structure? Well, because really where the, you the co-op is just about keeping more money to the fishermen for a longer period of time. Well, and, it's a vertical, and that, vertical integration. And it, and it really is, the, the, that's why we need to be looking yep. at, even the lobster industry should be looking at the co-op model. Right. There's, there's got to uh, be another, yeah, they, they, they need to be, okay. so we need to be looking at innovation, but the fish okay. exchange might not be the model that's really in the future. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like... The fish exchange may not be the model. Sell it. it. <laughs> we need, some guys we need to help. To buy it. We need to help. It's hard to say that out loud. We need yeah. to help the fishermen. Yeah. Okay. All right. Speaking of helping fishermen, small businesses, let's talk about that. I call this one "Show Me the Money." Rose, I'm gonna throw this one to you. Okay. What will it take to loosen up credit? Maine banks decreased small business loans 5.4% in 2009. So, what will it take for lenders to start easing credit for Maine small businesses? And can a real economic recovery take hold in Maine if small businesses can't really get right. the capital they need? Yeah, I mean, access to capital is, an, is a huge issue that we're going to be facing in terms of our recovery. And I, you know, not to be going back to the campaign, but I had championed the notion that we start a Maine bank because we send billions and billions of dollars out of the state of Maine, money that we invest. I mean, it's our money, it's our pension funds, it's, it's other money that's state-based and we send it to out-of-state banks, that money could stay here with a priority for lending to Maine-based businesses. And that would immediately provide an a, an, a flow of cash that is not available because obviously the lending requirements have changed. Risk, is very, risk aversion is very high. But the reality is small business is where all the job growth is going to be for now and in the foreseeable future. Quickly, weigh in. What do you think about capital? Or, uh, I think better ideas, good ideas generate capital. We need better ideas in Maine. That gets so that would overcome the collateral. I problem. think it's a much bigger concept than just whether or not there's money. All right. Well, I don't think it's just good ideas because I think sometimes good ideas come forward and the, the credit is still not there. And we aren't going to turn around this downturn um, until we can um, loosen up credit and get more jobs. We got a lot more to talk about, I think. So I'm going to keep you around, and we're going to do another segment uh, that we call it afterthought segment. It's going to be shown on the web, so we'll, we'll get more into that one and some other ones. So thanks. Uh, our discussion with Nicole Witherby, Rosa Scarcelli, and Matt Jacobson will continue in our exclusive Afterthought segment, seen only on the web. Just go to mainbiz.biz and click on the Mainbiz Sunday link. We'll be right back with some final thoughts. Mainbiz Sunday is made possible in part by funding provided by the Finance Authority of Maine.